Mr. Chairman, Mr. Buckley, the most difficult thing a speaker ever has to do is to address an audience sitting looking at its dinner. <laughs> However, I note that some of you have fortified yourselves by eating the first course. I hope for my comfort the second and third will not be served until I've finished after some 20 or so minutes. <laughs> It was a great honor to receive an invitation from this Foundation for Economic Education. I had been associated for many years with the Institute of Economic Affairs in Britain under the able leadership of the late Anthony Fisher and Ralph Harris, and later <laughs> with the Center for Policy Studies, which Keith Joseph and I set up to revivify true conservative thought. Your foundation was the first conservative foundation on economic affairs and was founded 50 years ago. A very judicious time to study the principles of a free society and the dissemination and implementation of those principles. I was very glad to be introduced by Bill Buckley a modest man with really nothing to be modest about. <laughs> for years, he almost alone carried the banner for the way of liberty, law, and limited government. He has been freedom's most consist consistent and staunch champion. Here in this audience, we know that in politics, you can never sit back and say that our beliefs and policies have won the battle of ideas. We have constantly to renew their vitality and see that they are implemented by effective political parties. That was a task which fell to me when I became Prime Minister in 1979. <clears throat> At the beginning of this century, Following the many scientific advances of previous years, the advent of mechanization and a steadily rising standard of living and of education, our forebears must have expected to enjoy a peaceful and progressive future. Of course, it was Mark Twain who said, never prophesy, especially about the future. He was right. But who could have foreseen at the beginning of this century two terrible world wars against tyranny, the one starting only 21 years after the end of the other and extending the world over? Or who could have foreseen at the beginning of this century the rise of a new despotism in 1917 as Lenin seized power in Russia and imposed ruthlessly the most total tyranny the world has known. Thatcher's law of politics is that the unexpected happens. In this century, it certainly did. Thatcher's corollary to that law is that when the unexpected does happen, you'd better be prepared for it. And that is what I tried to put into action in my time. <clears throat> we just have to remember that when this new despotism came in 1917, it did not arise from the people. Lenin seized power when Kerensky had won the first democratic election Russia had ever held. He was not allowed then to continue to govern Lenin seized power and imposed this terrible tyranny. Unwittingly, the world at that time had entered into the greatest economic experiment it had ever known, one between the total state control of communism with no freedom for the individual and our way of life, a free enterprise economy based on liberty, a rule of law, the true counterpart of democracy. 
the only system that gives everyone a say. Sometimes I say, when talking about communism, it couldn't have happened in the United States or Britain. <clears throat> it couldn't. We are not that kind of people. Your organization was formed with great foresight in 1946, at the end of the war. I remember it so very well. We had one in Britain with Winston Churchill, and a thought that he and everything he believed in might have been defeated was horrific. Nevertheless, we were in Britain defeated, and Britain had elected with a large majority its first socialist government. Socialism, the first cousin of communism, substitutes government action and judgment for that of the individual. It substitutes nationalized industries for industries run by free enterprise. And that socialist government did. It kept taxation very high. It planned everything. It nationalized industry after industry. It kept rationing the whole time. It was in power. Indeed, rationing, wartime rationing, did not cease in my country until we got back and abolished it in 1953. How come this attraction for socialism? How come this attraction still in some countries for socialism when we would say that the great battle has been won for freedom? I think there are three reasons for this kind of attraction. First, the views of Karl Marx had an attraction for a number of intellectuals. Never think that intellectual ability alone will solve all the political problems we face. Intellectual ability, unbridled by a good dose of common sense and humility, and without a belief in religion and things beyond yourself, can in fact make matters far worse. And of course, Karl Marx was an intellectual. It's very interesting that one of your great journalists visited Russia in 1919, Lenin's invitation. Lincoln Stephens, he came back and said, I have seen the future and it works. Very strange. <laughs> it didn't, of course, as he would have known had he visited it later. My friends, creativity, which you need for progress, is necessarily a quality which pertains to individuals, not to the state. And indeed, recently, we were all very pleased when our views received religious confirmation. It was Pope John Paul II, and I am not a Catholic, indeed, I am a Methodist, but I recognize a great religious person. It was Pope John Paul II who reminded us recently that the collapse of communism could not be considered simply as a technical problem, but rather it was the violation of human rights, the human right to private initiative, the human right to ownership of property, and the right to economic freedom. <clears throat> In other words, it was not just that communism made mistakes, the whole system was fundamentally wrong. In the end, my friends, we always knew that it would fail because it produced neither human dignity nor prosperity. And the time came when truth could no longer be kept out. As Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous commentator, wrote in the middle of the last century, do you want to test whether a people is given to industry and commerce? Examine whether this people's law gives men the courage to seek prosperity, the freedom to follow it up, the sense and habits to find it, 
and the assurance of reaping the benefit. A marvelous summary of everything we believe. De Tocqueville recognized that countries are not automatically rich in proportion to their natural resources. If that were so, my friends, if you were to make a table of countries in proportion to the natural resources they have, the top one would almost certainly be Russia. She has everything, oil, gas, diamonds, platinum, gold, silver, all the industrial metals, marvelous standing timber, a wonderfully rich soil. But countries are not rich in proportion to their natural resources. Countries are rich whose governments have policies which encourage the essential creativity, initiative, and enterprise of man and recognize his desire to do better for his family. Indeed, it is increasingly evident that man's greatest resource is man himself. So Japan, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, who have no natural resources, are now among the most prosperous countries in the world. I should say that when I say refer to man having all of these things, I should say that we have in England an interpretation law. I'm not sure whether you had it. I think you got away before we introduced it. <laughs> but um, we have an interpretation law that says where man appears in legislature, they put it rather beautifully, man embraces woman. <laughs> so where we refer to man, it includes women as well. <laughs> <laughs> But my friends, though communism may have collapsed and failed and be seen to have failed totally, I'm afraid the collectivist impulse, which at its root, at its root is a desire to pass responsibility and risk to governments and not to individuals, that collective impulse is still with us in socialism. Perhaps the attraction of socialism has been also, in addition to the, 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 the shallow attraction of Marxism for some intellectuals, it also has been the remembrance of the hardship of unemployment during the most difficult 30s, both in your country and in mine. Wartime came, and many people still blame the governments then in power for that terrible period of unemployment. But as Milton Friedman later pointed out, the Great Depression, like most periods of severe unemployment, was produced by government mismanagement rather than by any inherent instability of the private economy. <clears throat> That government mismanagement, as many of you would know, was that just when the money supply should have been expanded, the decision of governments then in power was to contract it, thus making worse a Great Depression. Yet a third possible reason for the attraction of socialism in Britain was that wartime naturally involved the substitution of national objectives for personal ambitions. Necessity meant that we had to. There was no future unless we met our first objective of defeating the enemy. And unless we had done that, and later you had done the same, liberty and democracy would not have survived. It was, I think, in the mid-40s, not only we had Ludwig van Mies, who, who was responsible for your founding, but we also had Hayek. And I remember very well, I was just at university reading for a science degree, that Hayek, brilliant and perceptive as he was, published to an astonished world the road to serfdom. He'd done the analysis, he knew where it would lead, and he turned out to be right. Hayek wrote, and he always had long sentences, I'm afraid our German and Austrian confrères do. <clears throat> so it's a long sentence. Hayek wrote, how sharp a break with the whole evolution of Western civilization, the modern trend towards socialism means, becomes clear 
if we consider it not merely against the background of the 19th century, but in a longer historical perspective. He continued, we are rapidly abandoning not the views merely of Cobden and Bright and Adam Smith and Hume, or even of Locke and Milton, but one of the salient characteristics of Western civilization as it has grown from the foundations laid by Christianity and the Greeks and the Romans. Not merely 19th and 18th century liberalism, but the basic individualism inherited by us from Erasmus and Montaigne, from Cicero, from Cicero and Tacitus, Pericles and Thucydides is progressively relinquished. Hayek had rebelled against the socialist view and said it flew in the face of freedom and its history. That view, nevertheless, the socialist view, had become an orthodoxy in the earliest part of this century and a dogma by the middle. The socialist view was that the story of human progress in the modern world was a story of increasing state power. Progressive legislation and political movements were assumed to be the ones which extended the intervention of government. What marks out our conservative vision is the insight that the state, the government, only underpins the conditions for a prosperous and fulfilling life. It does not and cannot generate them. State societies, economies, which allow the distinctive talents of individuals to flourish, themselves also flourish. Those which dwarf, crush, distort, manipulate, or ignore them cannot progress. It's only Western civilization, my friends, that has discovered the secret of continual progress. This is because only Western civilization has developed a culture in which individuals matter, a society in which private property is secure, a political system in which a range of competing views and interests is accommodated. The moral foundation of this system which is so spontaneous as hardly to seem a system, is the Judeo-Christian, the biblical outlook. The system's institutional foundation is the rule of law. And that is what we believe. Nevertheless, socialism took a hold in Britain, heavily allied to the trade unions. Indeed, the Labour Party started life as a political wing of the trade union movement. And with a large program of nationalization, increased expenditure, and high taxation, it took power in the post-war period. Then we came back in 1951, but such was the general feel of that time that successive conservative governments did not privatize the state-owned in state industries. They left them as the socialists had nationalized them. And they became supporters of that terrible phrase, the mixed economy. It was under these circumstances later that Keith Joseph and I set up our think tank to restore our beliefs and translate them into policies through the Conservative Party. We had been semi-socialist for a very long time, even through Conservative governments. And in 1974, after a period when we had started out as conservative but had forsaken our beliefs in face of great strikes, we were defeated. I became leader of the opposition. It's not a job I'd ever like to have again. I prefer government. And we were seeking to reestablish an understanding of the fundamental truths which had made Western life and the life of the English-speaking peoples what they were. This was the foundation of our conservative revolution. The first lesson to be, with, to be drawn from our rethinking is that the principles we restated, and which I've given to you, and which formed the basis of the policies we pursued, are as true and relevant now as they were two decades ago. The second lesson was that avoiding debate about the large issues of government and politics leads to directionless failure. 
Being prepared to state uncomfortable truths is a precondition for success. And we did state what some people called uncomfortable truths. First, we stated the inherent contradictions of the mixed economy. We said that inflation had to be ascribed to excessive growth of the money supply, which didn't suit some of our opponents. We said that you won't rescue people from poverty by creating a dependency culture. Indeed, if you do that, you will have a corrosive effect on the whole of personality. We said that political parties must be founded on clear principles, not merely on pragmatism or expediency. All of these, we said, and we started once again from first principles. Split some disagreements and there were plenty, as Keith Joseph and I took over, over important issues. Never did a party so much harm as the absence of honest principle debate. In 1979, we won the election. The country had had enough of socialism in practice. It took even Britain to be a supplicant to the IMF instead of to a nation providing the means for others to benefit. The decade of the 80s, when the policies which we reinvigorated were put into action, changed the direction of Britain and they were adapted in many other countries. Indeed, I remember the day when I was having a very difficult time. When you change direction, when you change all policies, the first things that show through are all the difficulties, all the dislocation. And they showed through in plenty. And it takes about three years for the benefits to show through. <clears throat> And what had happened to any of my predecessors who had attempted such a change was they gave up after about 18 months. And if you're to have a change, you must persevere. And my father had taught me, which I remembered, if you embark on any great occasion, any great mission, it's not the beginning, but the continuing of the same which yieldeth the true glory. <clears throat> we put it in rather more familiar doggerel language. It's easy to be a starter, but are you a sticker too? It's easy enough to begin a job. It's harder to see it through. And so I went in with the stubborn, female determination and obstinacy to see it through. <laughs> and I remember a statesman from another country, I will not tell you which, coming to see him in about 81, two years in, we were having a very difficult time. And he said to me, Mrs. Thatcher, we're watching you very closely. It was a rather sort of strange way to start a conversation. Um, <laughs> And I said, oh, really? Don't tell me why. Um, he said, because no one else has ever tried to turn back the frontiers of socialism. And if you succeed, others will follow. I thought that put a very great responsibility upon me, but also a very great opportunity. It so happened, I must tell you, that at the time, we were having problems in foreign affairs. I also had gone into office determined that the reduction in defense expenditure the Labour Party had implemented was wrong. We were living in a dangerous world. And that although I had to cut general expenditure in total within what we were going to spend, defense must have a bigger priority. And we implemented that. But of course, that didn't suit our opponents and nor some of our backbenchers who wanted more spent on social security. And I thought that defense security was more important. That turned out, <clears throat> and I must tell you, I think the same now. Defense expenditure is going down too far. We live in a dangerous world. 
I was very glad I'd taken the decision because by 1982, when I was having difficulty but the economy was beginning to show through, the Argentinians suddenly invaded the Falklands, 8,000 miles away. We didn't hesitate what to do. One of my generals reminded me only yesterday what had happened when the field marshal had come in to see me to receive his instructions. Apparently, and I didn't know this, he went back to the Department of Defense and said, I've never had such short instructions from a prime minister in my life. <laughs> she said, the Argentinians have invaded our islands and our peoples, throw them out. <laughs> have done it unless we'd taken the right decisions earlier. So what I'm saying to you is that the true conservative doctrine, both in home affairs and in overseas affairs, turned out to be right. And again, I must say to you, we were the first country in the, in the post-war world who did not appease an aggressor, but threw him out. And so, we succeeded, both on the home affairs with finances and on foreign affairs. Now, reform of the public finances was matched by reform of trade unions, deregulation and privatization of industries, and a great extension of the ownership of houses, shares, and savings. You asked me to say a word or two just about the special trade union reform. It's important, the law had given the trade unions in Britain enormous privileges and advantages so that everyone could go on strike and practically bring the nation to a standstill. And they had tried it several times. Indeed, one of the reasons why the Labour Party lost was because we had a winter of discontent when union after union went on strike and eventually they went on strike altogether and paralyzed the country. No one had succeeded in reforming trade union law. My predecessor, Edward Heath, had had a go in the 1970s, 71. He tried to do everything at once, and the trade unions had gone on strike, and we didn't succeed. I determined that we would tackle it differently. We'd not tackle it all at once. We would take it step by step. And I knew that if I got the judgment right, and how much we could do at each legislative measure, I would have over half the members of trade unions with me because they were fed up of being pushed around by their own officials. And so, step by step, we tried it. Step by step, four major legislative measures over eight years. Uh, at first, we started, in fact, to remove some of the legal immunities. What had happened was everyone had been able to go on strike. I made it law that you could not go on strike legitimately and be immune from the law of contract. You could only go on strike legitimately if you were at odds with your own employer. You could not have any sympathetic strikes at all. You had to have a quarrel with your own employer and a legitimate quarrel. And then, and only then, a strike was justified. Sympathetic strikes were out. Blacking of goods, you know what blacking is? So the trade unions would, black, would prevent certain goods being sold. Blacking was out. That also belonged to what we call sympathetic strikes. Picketing. They had picketed so many companies where the employers and the employees had no quarrel. Picketing we stopped except at the place where there was a legitimate strike and we reduced substantially the legitimate number of pickets. All of these things we did, we outlawed the closed shop. Do you know what a closed shop is here? Everyone who works for, for yes, well we outlawed it. 
It was wrong. And the number of strikes went down.